Hello, everyone, and welcome, Dr. Filippo Vedia, to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Neri. Um, doc Dr. Vedia, you graduated from J uh, Jefferson Medical College with a degree in cardiothoracic surgery. Is that correct? Um, yeah, so um, after I completed uh, medical school uh, at Jefferson in uh, Philadelphia, like you mentioned, I then went on and I did a uh, residency first in uh, general surgery, which is just basically, you know, kind of covers most aspects of surgery. And after completing that, I then completed another residency in cardiothoracic surgery, so specifically heart and lung surgery. And you also run your telemedicine practice, um, treating patients through lifestyle medicine, through dietary interventions. Tell us about that too. What do you do? What kind of people do you do you consult? Do you do help? Sure thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my story, um, which I think we'll probably get into a little bit more, you know, after I discovered uh, that I was quite unhealthy and figured out how to correct that for myself, I came to realize the importance of metabolic health in preventing heart disease and, in fact, most of the chronic diseases that people face these days. And, you know, rather than only being able to help people by operating on them, I have now come to focus as well on helping people to stay off my operating table and trying to educate people on what they can do to get themselves healthy before it gets to the point of developing advanced heart disease and other chronic diseases that might end them up on my operating table. You, you very famously mentioned that often on the social media, don't end up on my operating table. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, I, I, I continue to work as a heart surgeon and I'm blessed and happy to be able to offer that service to the people that need it. But like I said, in the end, you know, no matter how good a surgeon I might be or, or all the other, you know, fabulous heart surgeons that are out there in the world, you're always better off not getting to the point of needing heart surgery uh, than, you know, getting through heart surgery successfully. And so I now have a practice, a telemedicine online practice. Uh, through which I help people to learn about metabolic health, how to measure, how to optimize it with the goal of giving them the lowest risk of developing heart disease and other chronic diseases. Tell us of your personal journey to uh, lifestyle medicine. Because it's a fascinating story, your journey, and it's on your website as well for those interested. They can read on uh, Dr. Vedia's website. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I was always obese uh, as a child. You know, I was overweight. And that was despite the fact that my uh, family, you know, ate in lines with the dietary guidelines. Uh, I actually have a brother who is a type 1 diabetic, um, which obviously you're quite familiar with. And as you know, that meant, uh, you know, no sugar in the house. And at the time I grew up, the recommendations were to, you know, eat low fat, to have uh, skim milk instead of whole milk, to have margarine instead of butter, um, you know, get your six whole, you know, six servings of grains a day. Uh, we did not have any sugary cereals, but we did have lots of the non-sugary cereals, you know, things mm -hmm. like Cheerios and Wheaties and all that type of stuff. And we ate whole wheat bread. And as I said, it was, you know, very much in line with the, the dietary guidelines. And despite that, you know, I got progressively more overweight as a child. And I should also put in that I was very active as a child. I played sports year round. I, you know, would walk, ride my bike everywhere. Uh, so very active, eating as, you know, we were told we should eat. And despite that, I was always overweight. And throughout college and medical school, it got worse. Um, you know, medical school is uh, really not a very healthy environment. You know, you're studying hard, you're working long hours in the hospital, you're 
eating, you know, a lot of uh, hospital food, uh, which it turns out is not very healthy. And I continued to gain weight. And, you know, after medical school, when I finally had some time to kind of, you know, settle down a little bit, there were a few, you know, I made some efforts to lose weight. And I did that doing what I was taught to do, which was eat less and move more, you know, count my calories and get my exercise. And that would work in the short term. But like most people experience, it doesn't hold up over time and invariably you end up gaining the weight back and more. And then I did all the various programs that are out there, you know, whether it's counting points or using shakes as meal substitutes and all of those things. And, you know, like I said, as most people do, I had some short term successes, but always, you know, would end up uh, gaining the weight back and more. So about five, now about six years ago, I found myself pre-diabetic and morbidly obese. And I realized I was going to end up on my own operating table, but I really, you know, wasn't quite sure what else to do, what to try. And thankfully I, was, I came across some alternative information. Uh, Gary Tobbs uh, was a guest speaker at one of the medical meetings I attended. And he just, you know, he talked about uh, at that case, he had just written, at that time, he had just written the case against sugar. And it was really the first time I had heard these concepts around hormonal influences of obesity and how the types of foods we eat can be more important than the amount of food we eat. And the types of food we eat can actually make us eat more or less, but it can make our bodies, you know, have different reactions and store more or less of that food. So I immediately, you know, read his material and it all made a lot of sense. And I started down the low sugar, low carb, you know, ultimately keto and uh, finally carnivore pathways. And with that, I've lost over 100 pounds. I've maintained that weight loss for five years. I've reversed all my markers of, of poor health and now have optimal metabolic health. And like I said, along the way, what I came to realize is that most of the chronic diseases we deal with, and specifically the heart disease that I deal with every day, has its roots in metabolic health. And yet, for whatever reason, we never talk about that. We don't focus on it in medicine much. What is good meta metabolic health? Uh, what are yeah. the ind indicators of, of good health? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, it, as a simple concept, you know, being metabolically healthy means that your body is able to take the inputs that you're giving it, which is mostly food, but also things like your environment and sleep and all that, and utilize that correctly. So, you know, our bodies are meant to use some of the energy that we're taking in to fuel our ongoing activities every day, you know, all the things we do. And then we have the need to repair and rebuild tissues on a continuous basis. You know, all of our cells are always turning over. And then we're supposed to be able to basically store some energy because in the past, in a, you know, ancestrally, as we evolved as humans, there were times when food might not be readily available and we had to be able to survive those times. So we were supposed to be able to store some food and store some energy and then, you know, use that for times when energy and food wasn't available. And the problem is, is that our modern food environment uh, does a couple of things to screw that up. Uh, first and foremost <laughs> is for, for most of us, fortunately, there isn't any time when food isn't available. <laughs> There's no scarcity of food at all. Exactly. You know, thankfully, most of us live in an environment these days where food is all around us and a wide variety of foods are always around us, you know, year round from all the different areas of the world. Uh, so, you know, that that has had some effects. And then as we start getting more and more, you know, processing of our food that, you know, kind of can screw up those signals that our body uses to determine how much to store and when to tap into things. So, you know, that's what metabolic health is. Poor metabolic health basically means, you know, you're, you're storing too much energy, but you're also not able to tap into that energy at all. So that's why people who are very obese can be hungry all the time, you know, yes. even though they're walking around with all this stored energy. And even people who aren't obese, 
can get into problems where they're storing this energy in the wrong places, essentially, and it's still causing damaging effects. So to be able to measure if you're metabolically healthy or not, there are five basic measurements that, that are typically used. Um, the first measurement is your waist circumference. So if people just take a tape measure and they go around uh, their, uh, just above the level of their belly button and they measure, a uh, little different than your pant size. Um, and the cutoffs there are for uh, women. You want that number to be under 35 inches. For men, you want it to be under 40 inches. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't remember the... Uh, the conversion. I know you have an international audience, but uh, you we'll can, put it. <laughs> we'll put it in the those. description. Yeah. So that's measurement number one. Easy measurement. You can take it home, and I think that's one of the most useful measurements for people to track. It's more useful than weight uh, or or body mass index. Uh, waist circumference has a direct relationship to metabolic health. The second measurement that goes into determining metabolic health is your blood pressure. And if you're on medications to lower your blood pressure, that's already an indication that you're not metabolically healthy. And if you're not on any medications, you want the top number, the systolic blood pressure, to be less than 130, 130, and you want the bottom number, the diastolic, to be less than 85. So that, that's measurement number two. Measurements three, four, and five all require some blood testing. Uh, number three is your fasting blood glucose level. And you want that to be, first of all, again, if you're taking, if you've already been diagnosed as diabetic, if you're taking any medications to lower your blood glucose, uh, then you are not considered to be metabolically healthy. Uh, but you want your, without medications, you want your fasting blood glucose level to be under 100 uh, and again, that's uh, milligrams per deciliter, the uh, United States units, and uh, you can trans translate that to the international uh, measurements. And then measures number four and five are both off a uh, lipid panel, a cholesterol panel. panel. Um, you want to look at your HDL, what's called your good cholesterol. This, you want it to be higher, the higher the better. So you're considered not metabolically healthy if you are female, if your HDL cholesterol is less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, and if you're male, if it's, uh, you're not healthy if it's less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Women naturally have higher HDL levels than men. And the last measurement is your triglycerides level, which is one of the other numbers on your cholesterol panel, and the, uh, you want that to be lower and uh, anything that is above 150 milligrams per deciliter is considered un unhealthy. So those are the five measurements. And I suggest to everyone that you check, the, you know, that you know those numbers. So if you go to your doctor and he's not checking those things, he or she is not checking those things, um, you know, those are the numbers you need to know. And if, all five of them are not in line, that's a warning sign. Um, if more than three of them are abnormal, that actually diagnoses you with what we call metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome puts you at high risk for developing these other chronic diseases that we worry about, things like heart disease and diabetes and some forms of cancer and Alzheimer's disease. All of these things have been associated with poor metabolic health. And metabolic syndrome, we recently heard um, more about it uh, in relation to uh, COVID. So yeah, it must exactly. have a direct link with immunity. Yes, it does. And as you mentioned, you know, metabolic syndrome and, and some of the markers of poor metabolic health uh, have all been shown to predict worse outcomes if you get COVID. And they've also been shown to increase your risk of getting COVID. So one of the things I recommend to people that you can do to minimize your risk from COVID is being metabolically healthy. Okay. So how do people get metabolically healthy? What sorts of things should they eat? Because, I mean, we know, we understand that the current advice may not necessarily be correct. I mean, eat margarine, don't eat butter, eat, um, you know, eat low fat yogurt, maybe. So everything low fat because cholesterol, 
will give you heart disease. Well, I mean, the current advice isn't always correct. So please tell our audience what they should be eating or what they should be avoiding. Yeah, so I think the first thing that's helpful for people to understand is that whatever we're doing currently is clearly not working well because the statistics show that uh, as of 2016, when this data was last looked at, 88% of the adults in the United States did not meet all five measures of metabolic health. So, you know, that's a pretty staggering statistic. And what that tells me at a high level is, you know, whatever we're doing, and most of us are doing things that are, you know, fairly in line with the US dietary guidelines, uh, is not working well. So I think we need to start looking at other options. And, you know, of course, there are lots of, you know, conflicting other options that are put out there. You hear everything from vegan to carnivore. You hear you need to be low fat. You need to be low carb. Um, there's lots of, you know, information out there. Um, in the end, I think, you know, the key principle is we have to get back to eating real food. Um, when you look at what has happened to our food supply over the past, you know, 50 years or so, that, that the metabolic, the, the epidemic of metabolic disease has been clearly increasing, um, the trend is that our food has gotten to be more processed and it has gotten further away from eating the whole real food that all of our ancestors ate, you know, so foods that grow in the ground, or things that eat the food that grows in the ground uh, in, a, in as kind of close to a natural form as you can get them, I think is the best way to eat. Um, specifically, I think the things that people that are metabolically unhealthy need to eliminate from their diet uh, or need to minimize in their diet to get metabolically healthy are the highly processed carbohydrates and the fake fats, the vegetable and the seed oils uh, that are also highly processed. And when you look at most of the processed food, uh, most of the food that you can get in the supermarket that comes in a box, uh, it is the combination of those two things primarily. Mm -hmm. It's a highly processed carbohydrate, whether it's you know refined flour, sugar, mm -hmm. or, or both usually. And then it's a fake oil, a soybean oil, a canola oil, uh, you know, a safflower oil, things like that. What it's not is, you know, whole real food, vegetables, meat, seafood, dairy products, and then animal fats like, yes. you know, tallow and lard and butter and, you know, the minimally uh, processed, uh, you know, fats that fruit fats, things that come from, you know, olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil primarily. Uh, and those are the things that I think are healthiest for us to eat. And, you know, the balance within that of, you know, which of those foods and how much, uh, you know, I think is up for some debate. And that's where we get into the different, you know, strategies such as, you know, the Mediterranean diet or, you know, a keto diet and things like that. Um. Veg vegans can do, I mean, you don't have to be a meat eater or even a meat lover. Vegans can follow a low carbohydrate lifestyle, can't they? By eliminating processed carbs and sugars and perhaps starches. Yeah, you know, so um, ve vegans can be metabolically healthy, certainly, uh, but vegans can also be not metabolically healthy. There is a lot of food that's, you know, vegan, but highly processed. And again, I think that's what you need to eliminate. Um, the one caution I always, you know, do give vegans and, and I, you know, there, there are vegans that I work with in my practice. And the caution there is that there are certain, certain essential nutrients that you cannot get from a vegan diet. So you need to take those as supplements and that's a trade off. Um, but you know, some, some people are, are willing to take that trade off and, I have no problem with that. You know, in the end, any diet that is going to improve your metabolic health and maintain good metabolic health, I ha I'm fine with. And, you know, I've recently uh, written a book. It's going to be coming out soon. And in that book, I talk about all these concepts, 
But what I don't do in that book is I don't give the Ovedia 28-day diet plan like <laughs> most, most diet books do. Um, I, I lay out these concepts. I look at you know many different popular diets, everything literally from vegan to carnivore, and you know Atkins and keto and Mediterranean and, and kind of all the things in between. And I talk about what is metabolically healthy about them and what is not metabolically healthy about them. I had the honor to read the preprint of your book. And interestingly enough, it's called Stay Away From My Operating Table. Isn't that right? S stay Off My Operating stay off, Table. Stay yep. Off My Operating Table. Um, why don't you tell our audience about your book? When is it going to be released? Yeah, so the book is going to be released on November 11th. Uh, it's currently uh, up for pre-sale on Amazon. Uh, right now, it's just the Kindle format, uh, but soon the uh, print uh, hardcover, softcover, and there's also going to be an audio book, and all those should be coming up for pre-sale pretty soon. Um, but then the book gets released on November 11th. I I recommend it to anyone anyone listening to this um, to this interview today. Um, Okay, so I'm coming to diabetes, <laughs> a topic very close to my heart. I don't know if my audience know, well, some, some of my audience knows, uh, know me already. So I'm a type 1 diabetic, I wear a CGM. So I wanted to ask you about CGMs. I know you use them in your practice to help people or to support patients, to, to help them see their blood sugars or the, the, the way they react to certain foods. Yes. Um, how do you use CGMs and who do you use them for? I know you wear one, don't you, occasionally? Yes, I do. Even, even though so, you're not diabetic. So. Correct, correct. So what we know is one of the earliest hallmarks, uh, one of the earliest, you know, kind of markers of poor metabolic health is a altered response of your blood sugar to foods. And, you know, that's again reflected. One of the official measurements of metabolic health is your fasting blood glucose level. Um, but it's important beyond your fasting blood glucose level because, you know, when we go and we get our blood drawn for a fasting blood glucose, that's just telling us what our glucose is at that moment. It doesn't tell us anything about the 99.9%, .9%, you know, of our existence outside of that moment. So the reason I find the continuous glucose monitor so helpful is because it shows people in real time their reaction to the foods that they're eating. And for the most part, uh, foods that are not going to be metabolically healthy, you know, one of the things we know about them is that they're going to raise your blood sugar. And more so, um, you know, we know that people who are metabolically healthy versus people that are not metabolically healthy are going to have different reactions to the same foods. Um, and we're looking at things like how high your blood sugar goes after you eat a certain meal. And we're also looking for how long it stays elevated after you eat a certain meal. And, you know, what the sort of general pattern is. If throughout your day, your blood sugar is constantly going up and down, up and down, up and down, we know that that is a very harmful pattern, as opposed to someone who maintains a pretty, you know, flat line of their blood sugar throughout their day. Uh, and, and I think that is one of the best, you know, kind of real time measurements we can get of metabolic health is the CGM. So I, I use CGMs a lot in my practice, you know, mostly in non-diabetic patients uh, because, you know, most of my patients are not diabetic, uh, although I do have a lot of diabetic patients and I use it in both populations. And I think it's helpful in a couple of, you know, situations. When people are first starting kind of along their journey to metabolic health and they need that, you know, clarity, they need that feedback as to what foods they should be eating and what foods they should be avoiding. Um, the CGM is very helpful for that. And they also start to learn, you know, that sometimes it's the combination of foods, you know, this food by itself maybe doesn't do much and this food by itself doesn't do much. But when we put those foods together, it has a whole different effect. Or if I eat, you know, one food before another, 
you know, sometimes that's a different effect than if you switch the order around. Uh, so, you know, learning things like that is very helpful with the CGM. And then I think as you get further and further into your metabolic health journey, the CGM can be, again, good feedback to show you how you're doing. Because maybe foods in the past that, you know, you weren't able to tolerate, now that you're metabolically healthy, you know, you can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. So for me, for instance, you know, I know at this point that I can have some blueberries, you know, and I don't see much effect in my blood sugar. But people who are metabolically unhealthy have that same amount of blood of blueberries and their blood sugar shoots through the roof. And, you know, this is giving us an indication about underlying metabolic health. And that's why I find the continuous glucose monitors to be so helpful. Um, tell us about the, the correlation between diabetes and uh, cardiovascular health. I mean, it's, it's a big risk, I know, for, uh, as a diabetic, I know that is one of my biggest fears. I have to keep my HPA one zero as low as I possibly can right. to avoid uh, heart, heart problems. So what yeah, is the so, correlation? So, you know, the correlation basically has to deal with, we know that high levels of blood, sh of sugar in the blood, high blood glucose is directly damaging to the lining of the blood vessels. And we know that the basically, you know, the higher your blood sugar is over the longer period of time, uh, that is damaging to your blood vessels. There's a little bit of uh, differentiation we have to make between type one diabetics and type two diabetics as well. Um, you know, type one diabetics, um, the data is pretty clear that the better you control your blood sugar, and that's reflected by hemoglobin A1C, and the lower amounts of insulin that you can do that with, the lower the risk of heart disease, you know, over the long term. In type 2 diabetics, um, you know we, know, we know that type 2 diabetes is very strongly associated with, um, with cardiovascular disease, with coronary artery disease specifically. Um, so, you know, that is one of the major risk factors that we see for heart disease and for ending up with atherosclerotic heart disease. So if we can prevent type 2 diabetes by focusing on metabolic health, or we can reverse type 2 diabetes by focusing on metabolic health, we give those people a lot lower chance of developing heart disease, you know, over their lifetimes. And we know that we can reverse type 2 diabetes by focusing on metabolic health. Uh, Verda Health has published their data, and they showed at two years on their program, which is, you know, a dietary and lifestyle-focused program that, you know, improves all these markers in metabolic health. At two years on their program, 60% of their type 2 diabetics were off of medication and had a normal hemoglobin A1C. So, you know, that's one of the other messages I try to get out to people, that type 2 diabetes is a reversible and a preventable condition. And if you're going to your doctor and all he's doing is, you know, just putting you on more and more medication to try and better control your type 2 diabetes, he's, you know, that physician is not serving you well. Because the goal of all physicians, if someone comes to them with type 2 diabetes, should be, we need to reverse this condition. We need to get you off of these medications, or we need to be able to manage it with the lowest amount of medication possible while still controlling your blood sugars. And, and with that's no what insulin. Focus on metabolic health does. Yeah. For, yeah, exactly. For type 2 diabetics, <laughs> yeah, no you know, insulin. It yeah, is possible. <laughs> yeah, conceptually, you know, there's really no reason that a type 2 diabetic should be on insulin. Most type 2 diabetics actually have very high insulin levels. It's just that their body, because of their, you know, because of their poor metabolic health, their body isn't responding to that insulin. So the concept that we should just give them more insulin um, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And what you really want to do with a type 2 diabetic is get their body to respond to the insulin again and ultimately get their, you know, their insulin levels down. And the way to do that is, you know, by 
eliminating processed carbohydrates um, and focusing on the metabolic health. Focusing on real foods. <laughs> yes. Um, so what other uh, lifestyle interventions do you recommend to your, uh, to your patients? We talked of diet, dietary changes. Um, obviously, we're the low-carbon low uh, and fasting sort of uh, network. So how about fasting? Do you, do you recommend that or do you use it with your patients? Yeah, I think fasting is a great tool. I think it can help a lot with improving metabolic health. Um, usually my approach with patients is it's not the first thing that I do um, because, you know, when you are metabolically unhealthy and especially when you are on a high carbohydrate diet, um, it, it's hard to fast. You really have to kind of use that willpower. So instead, what I try and do with my patients is get them eating in such a way that they're going to be hungry less often, and then they're going to naturally start to fast. And this is where, you know, eating whole real food, especially foods that are high in protein, uh, which tend to be the most satiating over the long term, um, really comes into play. Because when you eat, you know, a, a, a lot of food that's real food and it's high in protein, you're going to stop being hungry. And that's what most people don't realize. Most people, you know, their whole lives, what they heard about dieting, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not even a big fan of that term, but you know, what most people think about when it comes to dieting is somehow restricting. You're restricting how much food you eat, or, you know, you're restricting the, the time that you eat, you know, intentionally, and then you have to sort of fight through that as opposed to if you eat the foods that are going to support your metabolic health, if you eat nutritionally dense foods, your body is just naturally going to be hungry less often. And then you can start to do things like fasting, which has an additive effect. Uh, you know, intermittent fasting is one of the best tools we have for improving metabolic health. It's just, it not, might not necessarily be the first tool that you want to go to. Exercise. How about exercise, Dr. Ovedia? Yeah, so yes. exercise plays a role in this as well. Um, you know, ultimately what I tell people is diet, um, you know, what you eat is probably, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the process. And then things like exercise and sleep and, you know, um, you know, mental health, uh, having a good community around you, you know, all these things play a role in it. Um, but first and foremost is the diet. If you don't if you're not eating the proper foods, it's going to be very hard to compensate for that with all the other things, no matter how much you exercise. And, and, you know, again, the evidence of this is you look at people, you know, we all know people who, you know, do a lot of exercise, run marathons, and they're not obese, and they end up with heart disease. And it turns out that they were metabolically unhealthy. Um, and no one ever thought to look for it because we figure that uh, because they're exercising so much and because they're not obese, they can't possibly be unhealthy. But the reality is, is that we know that you can be lean and be metabolically unhealthy. And that's one of the other key principles I try and get out to people. But ultimately, exercise is great. And especially um, the best thing for improving your metabolic health is building muscle. Muscle is the most metabolically active tissue we have. Um, and so the more muscle you build, the, the better in terms of metabolic health. And that's always the priority. And then if you still, you know, if you have all, other time to exercise and other activities you want to do, you know, that's where the cardio comes in. And cardio is certainly helpful, but it's not, it's not necessary. It's not essential is what I tell people. And the other thing I tell people around exercise is that, you know, it's not necessarily better to do more short, you know, 
periods of exercise, concentrated periods of exercise, just going to the gym an hour a day, but then sitting around the rest of the day and not being active uh, ultimately turns out not to be helpful. So more so than, you know, getting sort of dedicated exercise, I talk to people about just being more active throughout the day. Mm. And there are some tips and tricks in the book about doing that. But, you know, try and be more active throughout your day is another kind of key principle that I lay out for people. I mean, even basic things, and I know from my own blood sugars, um, basic things like cleaning the house. <laughs> <laughs> Once I reach the last level well, of vacuuming the last bedroom in the house, um, I notice my blood sugars are dropping. So it's a good, I mean, exercise cardio, part particularly aerobic exercises are a good way of burning sugar, but you cannot out, out to, what do they say? You cannot out to yes, or right. outrun a bad diet. So exactly. That's correct, right? <laughs> yes, you can't outrun a bad diet. Um. Okay, tell us more about your um, uh, book. We're uh, very excited. I can't wait for it to be released because I am going to, to buy a few and to give it to my family members as gifts. Um, what does it cover? What does it include? It's, it's primarily about metabolic health. Yeah, yeah. Metabolic so, again, the key principle is, you know, uh, using metabolic health to stay off my operating table, to stay healthy, and to avoid the uh, chronic diseases, you know, that plague our society. Heart disease being the number one killer uh, in the United States and worldwide, uh, not only, you know, this year, but for the past, you know, 30 years running pretty much. And then when you go down the list of the other common causes of death at year to year, things like uh, cancer, which many forms of cancer have been tied to poor metabolic health, things like Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, uh, kidney failure, you know, all of these things have been associated with poor metabolic health. So understanding what metabolic health is, how to measure it, which we've already talked about uh, some, how to improve it. And like I said, rather than give you, a, you know, this is the only plan, this is the only diet that's going to support your metabolic health, what I do is I go through the common, you know, diet plans that are out there, dietary strategies that are out there, and I talk about what is metabolically healthy about them and what is not metabolically healthy about them. And that, you know, that allows people to kind of figure out what works for themselves because it's not going to be the same answer for everyone. It has uh, to be sustainable, right? That's I mean, exactly it. Yeah, and that's one of the other key things I talk about in the book. You know, the problem I have with with the 28 day diet plan, you know, that that's so common out there is that one of two things happens when people go on those diet plans, either they meet their goal, they lose the weight that they're trying to lose and they say, oh, that's great. Now I can go back to what I was doing before or they don't lose that weight and they get down on themselves and they say, well, there's no point in doing this because I can't lose the weight. And, you know, they, they either way, it ends up failing over the long term. And we know the data, again, it's all around us that diets don't work in the long term. So instead, like you said, you need to make sustainable changes. Um, and I reframe it as, you know, a focus on metabolic health. So it's not that I, I don't view things as I'm not eating this food because I'm trying to lose weight or, or whatever I'm trying to do. The way I look at, you know, what I, when I'm deciding what to eat is I just think about what is going to support my metabolic health. And those are the foods that I eat. And I love what I eat. You know, I, I never feel deprived anymore. You know, I, uh, I enjoy everything I eat and I, can do that and stay healthy. And that's, you know, what really is the eye opening thing that most people don't understand. You know, most people think that in order to be healthy, you need to have this sort of diet restrictive mentality. And, and the opposite is true. You know, you can pretty much eat as much as you want of the foods that are going to support your metabolic health and you'll remain metabolically healthy. And it's only when you're hungry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I tell people, I tell people, eat when you're hungry and eat until you're full. 
Um, and then the trick is when you're eating the right foods, you're going to get hungry less often. Um, so you went on the carnivore. Well, I don't like using the word diet either, but on yeah. the carnivore sort of way of way of eating. How was that experience for you? And how, what kind of an effect did it have on your blood sugars? Yeah, so, um, you know, the carnivore way of eating um, from a blood sugar standpoint is probably the best uh, blood sugar control uh, one can get. You know, when you are eating essentially no carbohydrates and you're eating protein and fat, you know, in their natural forms only, um, that get, basically it's the most boring CGM you'll ever see. It's like a flat line. Uh, and, you know, you can't even tell. Like if I don't label you know, what time I ate, no one would even be able to tell. There's some you know, minor little bumps here and there. A lot of times I get more of a blood sugar effect from exercise, like you said, uh, than I do from when I eat. Uh, or other stressors in my life, you know, I'll see, you know, if I'm uh, doing a difficult surgery or I'm, you know, giving a lecture, uh, you know, I'll see my blood sugar go up a lot more than it does when I eat. Uh, so carnivore from a blood sugar control standpoint is, is really unmatched uh, as far as I'm concerned. The thing that I found most beneficial about carnivore uh, over the other sort of low carb, you know, strategies is that it just is simple. You know, there's nothing to count. There's nothing to, you know, track. Uh, I'm not worried about, you know, it, I, I'm just eating you know, those foods that fall within carnivore. And I just found it easy. The shopping is easy. The cooking is easy. It, it just, I, I worry, I, I didn't have to think about food at all when doing carnivore. I don't have to think about food. So for the past two and a half years or so, I've been primarily carnivore. You know, it's what works for me. But again, it's not, I don't tell all my patients, you should go carnivore. You know, I put it out there as an option. And like I said, in my book and in my practice, when I'm talking with people, I say, you know, these are, you know, you can eat any food you want as long as it's going to support your metabolic health in the end. And, you know, we'll find the strategy that works for you in particular. Uh, but for me, I have found carnivore to be the most helpful, the most sustainable. Like I said, I've now been, you know, over two and a half years on it. And uh, I really, I, I don't see any reason to stop because it, it, it's working for need. you. It's working for me, exactly. And it, but it's not as restrictive as people think, is it? No, it's really not, you know. So I eat a wide variety of meats, you know, so that's beef and lamb and pork and, you know, chicken. Uh, I eat seafood, a wide variety of seafood. I eat eggs, I eat dairy, you know, so yogurt and dairy. And so, you know, it really isn't that restrictive. And, you know, people can, people actually get very creative with carnivore. There's all sorts of, you, you would think like, why do you need a, a, a cookbook for carnivore? But there are all sorts of carnivore cookbooks out there that you can make, you know, just about anything you want, you know, as a carnivore. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, like I said, I find it just very simple. You know, the shopping is simple. The, the preparation is simple. And it, uh, you know, and, and it also keeps me less hungry less often, which is one of the other things, you know, I said that is good for metabolic health. So for the most part, I eat once or twice a day. And again, I don't do that because I'm restricting myself. I do that because I'm only hungry once or twice a day. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, even uh, for type ones, the carnivore diet is probably the only diet that would ensure those flat, <laughs> flat lines, because it's difficult for a type one to get those flat lines, to make sure you're getting enough insulin throughout the day, but you're not having any highs and lows. But the carnivore diet is, um, is very helpful uh, for type ones as well. So if any type Top ones are listening to this. Um, coming back to our uh, to, to, to lipid uh, profile test, you did mention yeah, yeah. the HDL. Now we left the total cholesterol out, you know, because that's part of the routine test. Should we look at the total cholesterol? And what does it mean anyway? I mean, that's one thing. And um, 
and also the LDL cholesterol. So right. what are these? What do they indicate and should we really worry about them? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, a, a bit of a controversial topic, and it's something that I spend a lot of time, you know, anyone that's following me on social media sees I, I talk about it a lot, and it's one of the main reasons, you know, one of the main things I work with people in my practice on. Obviously, my background as a heart surgeon gives me a very, you know, unique insight into heart disease. I literally, you know, uh, have my hands in people's chest and operating on them. And I see exactly what, you know, heart disease looks like uh, every day. So as you mentioned, you know, when we went through those five markers of metabolic health, there are two of the three measurements that are on a standard cholesterol panel, HDL mm -hmm. and triglycerides are in there. But the other one, the LDL cholesterol is not in there as a marker of metabolic health. And the total cholesterol is just sort of a summation of, of you know, those three. Um, so when you actually look at the data around cholesterol and specifically its relationship to heart disease in particular, um, but also as a larger, you know, issue of, you know, what we call in the scientific literature, all cause mortality, um, but basically, you know, how long people live, um, you, you see, you know, the relationship isn't as clear as we would be led to understand these days. You know, the central messaging around heart disease is that the most important factor is your LDL cholesterol specifically. And your total cholesterol, you know, was kind of uh, the historic measure before we were better at, you know, kind of breaking down these cholesterol uh, measurements. But when you actually look at the data, the relationship isn't that clear, you know. So, for instance, the studies that most show the relationship between LDL cholesterol and heart disease, people that have an elevated LDL cholesterol versus people who don't have an elevated LDL cholesterol, the risk associated with that of developing heart disease is about somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7 times high, as high, uh, depending on the study you look at. However, when you look at those same studies, those same data sets, and you pick out the people who are metabolically unhealthy and insulin resistance is you know, one of the common ways to measure this, that risk of heart disease for someone who is insulin resistant versus someone who is not insulin resistant is about six times. So five times more important, essentially, insulin resistance versus LDL cholesterol levels. So we and should so, worry more about insulin resistance. Exactly. And why don't we measure it? Why, don't yeah. we, why is it not routinely measured? Well, you know, again, I think that comes down to the fact that we have medications that lower LDL cholesterol. So it's very easy to set, you know, broad guidelines and apply them to populations and say, if someone has an elevated LDL cholesterol, you give them this medication, you bring down the LDL cholesterol, and maybe that does lower their risk of heart disease a little bit, but it's nowhere near the magnitude that people perceive it to be. And so, you know, the benefits of these medications are overstated. And then, you know, to be honest, the the negative effects of being on these medications, especially over the long term, because remember, we're now talking about 30 year olds, even 20 year olds that I see started on statins. And so they're going to be on those medications for 40 and 50 years. And the reality is, is that we know very little about those long term effects, you know about 30 now, you know, so um, we, we, we don't know, you know, what happens to people who are on them for 40 or 50 years. There are some concerning signals within that data. Um, so I don't tell people, you know, you should never take a statin. I don't tell people that statins have no use in the, you know, prevention of heart disease. I just, you know, go through the data. And this is what most physicians don't know, don't do, because they don't know the data to this detail. Um, but when you really go through that data and you talk about the risks and benefits of these things, you end up 
like you said, you know, why don't we just focus on insulin resistance and metabolic health? And oh, by the way, you know, most people that improve their metabolic health don't end up raising their LDL cholesterol. Some do, and that gets, you know, talked about a lot. And, you know, uh, I know a lot of people in your audience will have had the experience where they go on a keto diet or a low carb diet and all their numbers get better. You know, their blood sugar comes down, their hemoglobin A1C gets better, their HDL goes up, their triglycerides come down, they're, you know, they're less insulin resistant if they have a doctor that looks at that. All those things happen, but their LDL cholesterol goes up a little bit. And the physician immediately says, oh, this is a dangerous diet, it's killing you, you gotta get off. That's what happens. And again, it just, <laughs> yeah, it just, it just makes no sense. Because you look at the totality of the evidence, um, you know, and insulin resistance and poor metabolic health is so much more of an important factor when it comes to the prevention of heart disease, uh, that that is what I tell people they should be most focused on. And we can talk about LDL cholesterol and it might play a little role, but in the end, it is not the causative factor of heart disease that we are led to believe. So we can safely eat butter, we can safely eat animal fats, <laughs> we can yes. safely eat meat, it's not going to cause us cancer or there is very little sort of evidence of that. Well, why didn't you tell us about that? Well, that's, I think that would be interesting because we did talk about the carnivore diet. So yeah. is there any so, evidence that meat causes or red meat specifically causes cancer? Yeah, so um, two, two issues there, you know, saturated fat and heart disease. And the traditional thinking was that saturated fat increased your risk of heart disease. And again, the data just simply does not show that. Um, there was some data early on that was used that kind of got us going down this whole, you know, uh, pathway of thinking that saturated fat caused heart disease or was a primary contributor to heart disease. And we now know in retrospect that that data, it was poor quality data, uh, and, and a lot of it was kind of manipulated, uh, you know, by the by the uh, scientists of the time. So you know, it's pretty clear from the data now that there isn't a relationship between saturated fat and heart disease. And in fact, you know, the U.S. dietary guidelines took out their caution about saturated fat, uh, actually, you know, two, two revisions ago. So the 2015 guidelines, and this was carried forward to the 2020 guidelines, say in them that saturated fat does not have enough evidence as a nutrient of concern is how they put it, as opposed to the previous versions, you know, had a limit, you know, of how much saturated fat should be in the diet. So that's the first thing to understand for heart disease. In terms of its relationship to cancer, again, red meat has never been shown with good data to be tied to cancer. There is maybe, and I say this, you know, maybe a little bit of a signal around processed meats and cancer, but even that is very weak data and it has been inconsistent. The reason that, you know, meat got associated with cancer was because when most people eat meat, you know, most common thing in, in America is a hamburger. And so that hamburger is going to have the meat, but it's also going to have the bun and it's also going to have the toppings. And most people with their hamburger are going to have French fries that are cooked in, you know, vegetable and seed oils. And they're going to be drinking a, a, a you know, a soda, a sugar beverage. And when they go and they do these food surveys, you know, they say, you know, they ate a hamburger and that gets down as meat. And then they see the relationships with poor health, like cancer and heart disease. And they say, oh, the meat must be causing it. But the reality is, is it's all that other stuff, you know, that goes along with the meat that's causing those negative effects. It is not the meat itself. Well, it's been very educational. We're going to wrap up very soon. One last question. Sure. Um, what's the first thing you would advise someone to do if they come to you metabolically unhealthy? What's the first thing? Obviously, 
there are too many recommendations. You don't want to sort of overwhelm them. Yeah. What's the first thing you tell them to do? Well, you know, the first thing I tell people to do is measure your metabolic health and pay attention to it. And then, you know, if you already know you're unhealthy, you know, the, the, the best principle, the best advice I can give people is eat whole real food. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining today. We appreciate your time, Dr. Obedia. Thank you. And if anyone wants to kind of learn more about what I'm doing and follow me uh, on Twitter, I'm at iFixHearts. And then uh, if you go to my website, iFixHearts.co, it actually takes you directly to a quiz that you can fill out to assess your metabolic health. And then from there, if anyone's interested in possibly working with me, there's a link to book a discovery call and find out more about my practice. And finally, the book, again, Stay Off My Operating Table. It's going to be releasing November 11th, and it's going to be available, you know, on all the usual places, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. It's going to be an audio book. It's going to be a Kindle version, and it's going to be a print version as well. We'll put all those details in the description as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thank you.